Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, a look at recent Air Force mishap figures and some changes to the service's PT policies. Also, the first delivery of a new F-15 EX jet arrives at Eglin and the Air Force's plans for its KC-46 tanker fleet. Plus, analysis on the evolving space of counter drone warfare in the near future. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. In our first story this week, a recent report on Air Force mishaps over the prior year showed some good and bad for the service, which has been on alert in prior years following a number of fatal accidents. Air Force Times reporter Steve Losey breaks down the report. Steve, thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got some new data out on mishaps from the Air Force. Uh, tell us what we've learned. What are the highlights so far? So the Air Force last year saw the fewest of the most serious kind of mishap involving manned aircraft in at least a decade. That's good news, but there's kind of an asterisk that goes along with that. Partially because of the coronavirus pandemic, the number of flight hours airmen flew also plunged to its lowest level since at least fiscal 2011 last year. Last year, airmen flew about 1.3 million hours, which is much less than the 1.5 million hours uh, flown in 2019, and far less than the nearly 2 million hours airmen flew in 2011. So that means that the rate of accidents per flight hour actually is kind of ticked up over the last year. What does that mean? means that several years into the Air Force's effort to try to fix the problem of accidents in manned aircraft, it hasn't shown a whole lot of progress and it still has a long way left to go. Steve, now there was a difference in the numbers of the classes of mishaps. What can you tell us about that? So the most serious mishaps, class A's and B's, the ones that run from either $600,000 to $2.5 million or $2.5 million and up or that result in someone's death, those actually increased. Class C mishaps, the ones that run from 60 grand to 600 grand, those declined a decent bit. That's what's driving the bulk of the Air Force's mishap decline. Uh, Steve, so what is the difference between mishaps? Why is one different than the other? So the most serious mishaps are the Class A's and the Class B's. Class A's are those that cost at least two and a half million dollars, result in an aircraft being destroyed, or result in someone's death. Class B's run from $600,000 to $2.5 million, and Class C's run from 60 grand to 600 grand. Now, Class A's and Class B's, those actually increased in the last year. Class C's saw a pretty sizable decrease, which is good, but the fact that we're still seeing more Class A and B mishaps, that's concerning. We talked to uh, Major General John Rauch of the Air Force Safety Center and asked him, what may be driving that? He pointed to the fact that the Air Force is bringing on a lot more um, new aircraft, advanced aircraft, such as the F-35. As we bring on more and more um, new aircraft, some of the aircraft that are uh, that are low observable or just new um, end up with, uh, at least initially, uh, mishaps that otherwise would have been a Class C or Class D on a different aircraft would end up being more expensive. For example, if you have a problem with an F-22 or an F-35 engine, it's more likely to be in the higher category than it would be if it was on uh, a, an older aircraft. And so we do see um, some inflation in numbers driven by the increased cost of the components. And obviously the F-35 is one of those uh, platforms that we've got a growing number of those in the inventory. Another factor making it more expensive is the fact that planes like the F-22, the F-35, those fifth generation fighters, they have low observable stealth coating. 
and when they get damaged or repairs need to happen, it's very easy for that coating to get damaged again. And that drives up the cost of repairing them. So that's a lot about cost and repairs. Uh, what about the human cost, Steve? What did the data reveal about fatalities over the fiscal year? So the data showed that in 2020, tragically, the Air Force lost seven airmen. Most of those were due to fighter crashes, although one, Staff Sergeant Cole Condiff, was lost over the Gulf of Mexico due to a parachute mishap um, when he was pulled from a C-130. Now, that is lower than the average from the last five, 10 years, which is um, an improvement, although it is greater than the two airmen who were lost in 2019. Uh, Major General Rauch pointed out that the two airmen lost in 2019 tied for the Air Force's lowest uh, number of deaths ever, but he pointed out even two deaths is too many, and there's a lot of work the Air Force needs to do to get um, get that number down to zero. Our quest, our goal has got to be to drive this to zero, um, realizing that uh, that this can be an unforgiving environment we operate in, and so how do we push that to that direction? You know, each accident is investigated, um, but obviously the ones that have fatalities get investigated uh, and get more attention to try and make sure, you know, whatever happened in that string, uh, to try and make recommendations and implement changes so that that doesn't ever happen again. And not that we don't do that in every one, but clearly that gets some of the most attention for each one. So it sounds like the Air Force knows it needs, still needs some improvement and a bit of a mixed bag on these numbers. Anything else to add on this, Steve? Yeah, the Air Force has made, uh, made it very clear that it knows this is a serious problem. It's trying to correct it, but one thing is clear from this data, it still has a long ways to go. Thanks, Steve. In other Air Force news, the service has also announced a pair of changes to its PT procedures. Military Times' Jesse Karangu has the story. A pair of changes are coming to the Air Force Physical Fitness Exam, and they're expected to roll out this year. A new uniform change is also being released pretty soon, and that'll include a new t-shirt, jacket, pants, and shorts. A new technology is even being used that'll distinguish these uniforms from the uniforms worn in the past. We recently spoke to Diana Correll of the Air Force Times, who gave us the scoop on this latest update as well as when airmen can expect to take their next physical fitness exam. Diana, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Doing well, thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you. Um, before we get started on the new uniforms uh, being released, uh, let's discuss the resumption of physical fitness tests. Uh, they were paused for airmen during the pandemic and are being delayed again. Why? Yes, that's correct. So the Air Force has um, delayed resuming physical fit fitness assessments um, yet again. They were originally scheduled to resume in October 2020, then January 2021, then April 2021, and now they are slated to resume in July 2021. Um, the Air Force isn't the only branch of the military that has pushed back these physical fitness assessments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I think the reasons for doing so are all pretty similar at this point. And, are designed to ensure proper social distancing. Um, the military has cited that it wants to vaccinate as many service members as possible before resuming these physical fitness tests and also wants to avoid flu season. And so once these uh, service members return to normal testing, they'll notice that the test is uh, taking a change and uh, things are gonna be different this time around. Uh, do you know why that is? And, and uh, when they decided to implement these changes? Yes, so there will be a few changes that um, airmen can expect once the test does resume. Like you said, um, the test will employ a new three component scoring table and age groups will be broken down by five years rather than 10. We are still waiting to learn a little bit more about this new scoring table, but more details are expected to be released in June. Um, additionally, the waist measurement component of the test as a point driven aspect will no longer be uh, included, but it will still be conducted to ensure airmen are meeting body composition standards. Um, airmen can expect the test to consist of three parts, a timed 1.5 mile run and one minute each of push-ups and sit-ups. Meanwhile, the Air Force is also looking into several other options for strength and cardio components for the test, 
such as a 20 meter high aerobic multi shuffle run, planks, burpees, and more. As far as why um, some of these changes are possibly happening, the Air Force had said that it's reviewing some of its standards to determine if the current standards in place are still compatible with today's Air Force. Thanks, Diana. Um, let's turn to the new gear they'll be wearing. Uh, what type of new technology has been added to these uniforms that makes it unique? And is this something other military branches are considering? So yes, the Air Force has given the green light on new designs for a physical training gear uniform that includes a new PT jacket, t-shirt, shorts, and pants, which are made of softer fabrics that dry quickly and are tailored for specific types of physical activity. For example, the new designs have two pairs of shorts, one that is lined and shorter and ideal for running, and then a longer pair of shorts that has zipper pockets for other types of training. Another key change is the track jacket will now have a slimmer fit and is made with fabric that won't create as much noise during workouts. The next step for the Air Force is to move into the production phase. These uniforms are expected to become available in 2022 and will become the requirement by 2026. Um, there are some similarities between these new Air Force PT uniforms and uh, PT uniforms across other services. For example, the Navy's uh, PT uniform that it unveiled in 2019 included moisture wicking and odor resistant material and also had shorts that um, also had a zipper on the right hand side, similar to the Air Force's shorts. Uh, similarly, the most recent update to the Army's PT uniform also employed quick drying fabric. So it seems like this is um, definitely gaining traction across the services. Diana, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. The Air Force says in a press release that in addition to improving performance, they hope that these uniforms will, quote, accommodate various athletic interests. Now, the Air Force is doing this for the first time in 16 years. And coming soon, they're also expected to release a new long-sleeved t-shirt and hoodie. I'm Jesse Karangu for Defense News Weekly. Thanks, Jesse. That's it from the military side of the house this week. When we return, we'll hear about the latest plans for the KC tanker fleet. And later, a look at the threats of drones in coming battles. The U.S. Air Force is preparing to offer some new KC-46 tankers for operational use as early as this year, although continued technical issues will keep the aircraft from combat missions. Under the new plan, announced by Air Mobility Command in February, the Air Force will commit a certain number of KC-46s to execute operational missions tasked by U.S. Transportation Command, which manages how the U.S. military transports people and equipment around the globe. The Air Force currently has 44 KC-46s of the 179 it plans to buy. By the end of 2021, that number will be up to 60 tankers. However, there are a number of missions that the KC-46 will not be permitted to perform until its critical deficiencies are resolved and the Air Force deems it fully operational. Earlier, I spoke with Defense News Air Warfare reporter Valerie Encina for this week's Actionable Intelligence. Valerie, welcome. There's some news on the tanker front. Can you tell us a little bit about where the KC-46 is in terms of operations? Yeah, so a couple weeks ago, the Air Force decided that, you know, even though the KC-46 has been sort of mired in some very longstanding technical issues for the past um, couple of years, that it was going to try to figure out a plan to put the KC-46 into limited operations. So the, the problem that it's been having, you know, years long now at this point, it revolves around the remote vision system. Um, and that is a system of cameras and sensors that KC-46 boom operators are going to use when they steer the boom into a receiver aircraft and start pumping gas. So the KC-46 kind of works a little bit differently than legacy tankers do. You know, in, in those KC-10s, KC-135s, you have the operators, they're sitting in the back, they're looking out a window and they, act, they can actually see, you know, visibly, you know, what is happening, you know, how close am I, how, how close is the boom to this aircraft, you know, what's happening. And they, so they can re rely on their eye and KC-46 boom operators, they're seated up towards the front and they're completely reliant 
on, on this system of cameras and sensors. And right now, um, there are some deficiencies associated with that where the imagery just isn't up to snuff and in certain lighting conditions, it's very difficult to refuel. So the limited capacity that the KC-46 is at is it can refuel planes in training and not stealth planes and not also not another type of plane. So um, yeah, it cannot refuel the A-10 at this point. And that's because of a problem with the KC-46 boom. Um, when the Air Force was you know, approving the requirements for the KC-46, they told Boeing, look, this, this boom, you know, it meets our requirements, go ahead and build it this way. But in actuality, uh, the A-10 doesn't produce enough thrust so that it can actually uh, refuel um, from a KC-46 with uh, its boom being as stiff as it is. So now uh, Boeing is sort of kind of having to go back to the drawing board, uh, redesign that boom uh, so that the A-10 can finally uh, refuel from it. And stealth as well, right? Yes, and stealth planes as well. Um, that's a different problem. That's that's due to the problems with the remote vision system. Uh, there are concerns that, you know, if if uh, F-35 or B-2 or another stealth plane were to get fuel from the KC-46, you know, if the lighting conditions are poor and a boom operator doesn't see exactly where they're ste steering uh, the boom, that could collide with the aircraft and skim off the surface of uh, the low observable coating, the stealth coating that um, keeps those planes from being detected by radar. So that's something that they want to avoid um, using that tanker for right now. Are we gonna see the KC-46 on real life deployments anytime soon? No, not anytime soon. The commander of Air Mobility Command, General Van Ovost, made it very clear that the KC-46 is going to be staying out of the Middle East, uh, and it's also going to be staying out of the Indo-Pacific and Europe. Um, so all of the combatant commands um, that do, that, you know, would would deploy that, that KC-46 in an operational context, um, th that's not something that's going to happen right now. Um, the missions that the KC-46 is going to be allowed to take on are going to be more stateside missions. Um, it might help to escort fighters. It might um, help refuel aircraft during exercises or training missions. Um, but for right now, they wanna make sure that um, for operations, for an actual combat environment, they wanna make sure that operators have a proven tanker that they can rely on. We'll see where this one goes. Valerie, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And now for industry headlines. The Air Force announced it received its first F-15EX on March 10th in Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, and will soon begin testing the Boeing aircraft. The newest EX version of the F-15 comes with advanced avionics, such as Eagle Passive Active Warning and Survivability Electronic Warfare System, a digital cockpit, the more advanced ADCP-2 mission computer from Honeywell, and fly-by-wire flight controls. The Air Force placed its first order for the F-15EX in July 2020, awarding a contract for the first lot of eight jets with a value not to exceed about $1.2 billion. The entire program has a ceiling value of $23 billion. The service plans to buy at least 144 F-15EXs to replace the F-15C and D fleet, which is at an average age of 37 years and is starting to see structural strain. However, the contract has options that would allow the Air Force to buy up to 200 jets. And that's it in industry news this week. When we come back, Personal finance expert Jeanette Matt gives service members tips on staying ahead of COVID-19 scams. And later, a conversation on how the Army could counter swarms of drones. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives her latest tips. We've all been doing our best to stay safe and healthy through the pandemic. It's just as important to take precautions with your finances right now too, because fraudsters are taking advantage of this COVID-19 era, luring their targets in with online phishing and vaccine-related scams. As the vaccine rolls out, there are more vaccine-related websites popping up. While many are legit, some are using our desire to get vaccinated to steal personal information. There's also been an uptick in phishing attempts that appear to be trustworthy and even use real company names and logos. 
The thing to know is you can't pay to get early access to the vaccine, and no one calling about the vaccine will ask for your social security number, bank account information, or credit card number. If these vaccine offers seem too good to be true, they probably are. So stay alert. Don't click links and emails. Check your accounts regularly for any suspicious activity and never give away your personal information. You'll be safer from fraud and give yourself a little more peace of mind. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage, be sure to check out Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com for daily news across the services, as well as DefenseNews.com. To get a list of our top stories in your inbox each day, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. For an ongoing list of our virtual events and conferences, head to defensenews.com slash events. And when we come back, an expert outlines how inexpensive drones pose new threats to American forces. Welcome back. One new military threat on the minds of leaders is how to deal with the proliferation of inexpensive drones that can be multiplied and converted into devastating weapons. These swarms are the topic in the live broadcast, Future Tools, Future Battlefields, in partnership with AUSA Global Force. Defense News Editor Mike Cruz brings us more on his chat with Dr. Daniel Gray of the Lexington Institute. Our audience today is very familiar with unmanned systems and my own sense is that maybe three to five years ago some people were talking about counter UAS systems but now the the volume on that conversation seems to have really crescendoed so I, I want to hear from you on this how would you how would you describe and, and assess the threat of UAS today specifically for army ground troops and, and military combat vehicles the threat is growing we, we all hear about large unmanned aircraft systems, uh, predators and the like, but the real growth now is in small systems. They call them class one and two, 50 pounds. They fly relatively slow, relatively low. Don't carry much in the way of payload, but with the advance in sensor technology, in guidance technology, these and that they're commercial, these systems are now proliferating around the world. They're in the hands of terrorists. They're in the hands of, uh, they were in the hands of ISIS. They're in the hands of our adversaries or potential adversary militaries. And they can transform warfare. They pose a, a targeting threat to army systems and vehicles, but they also can be used actually to attack vehicles, even attack personnel with uh, small payloads. You can now buy systems on the open market, quad rotors and the like. And even if they aren't armed, they have this kind of sensors on them that can be used uh, to go spot hostile forces, to go target places. They can be used against uh, airfields and other facilities, just run them into the engine of an aircraft. What's also happening is we're starting to develop the capability, commercial as well as military, to do multiple UASs at the same time. So instead of just having one or two, that's what's different from an IED. Instead of just one or two in the road, we're now potentially in the world of swarms of these things, multiples, 50, even a hundred of them coming at our forces at the same time, which complicates defense against them hugely. In a swarm, if I'm looking to attack a vehicle, I can send five UASs out. Maybe the defense can shoot down one or two unless it has a very wide area capability, but those others can get through. Or you can simply use swarms of very cheap UASs to run the other side out of ammunition. So if I'm trying to shoot at them, if I'm trying to use missiles against them, if I'm trying to use a, a killer drone against the drone, I'm in this kind of fight between offense and defense where, frankly, up until recently, the offense has the advantage. That is, the UAS operator has the advantage. And, and so if, if the Army had to deploy a counter UAS capability, you know, tomorrow. What what would that look like and, and how would it help how would it help the, the troops on the ground and the vehicles there? Well the army, interesting enough, has a really good capability at the moment. It doesn't have enough of them. And it's a dedicated system. It's called MLIDS, which is mobile, low, slow, 
UAS integrated defeat system. That's the key, integrated defeat system. It's on two vehicles, multiple sensors, so it can spot all these objects, big, small, low-flying, hovering, and it has multiple ways of defeating it. It can use a cannon if it can spot it. It can use a coyote counter drone against the drone, and it also has non-kinetic electronic warfare capabilities. So you essentially, the, the operator can pick if it's a swarm, I, go, I may go non-kinetic. If I've got one object out there, I can shoot it with a bullet. That also establishes a cost exchange ratio that the defense can live with. And it's a mobile system. There's a fixed version of the same thing that the army is buying. So multiple sensors, multiple effect systems, and a smart command and control network is what you need to defeat this new threat. For more on that story, head to c4isrnet.com. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.